have a wonderful speaker tonight. And after the lecture, there's going to be a Q&A session. Um, so for the question and answer session, if everybody wants to just put their questions in the chat. Um, and I'd like to introduce our speaker, Julia Brennan. She is going to be speaking to us on the preservation efforts at the Tool Slang Genocide Museum in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, Julia Brennan is founder of Caring for Textiles. Uh, she has worked in the field of textile conservation since 1985. She is committed to conservation outreach and the protection of cultural property achieved by providing stakeholders with sustainable skills. Since year 2000, uh, she has led conservation workshops and research in museums, monasteries, and community-based collections across the globe in Bhutan, Madagascar, Algeria, Indonesia, Laos, Thailand, and Taiwan. Most recently, she has worked in Cambodia and Rwanda, helping to preserve the clothing of victims of mass atrocities. She started this project in Cambodia in 2015, and it is ongoing. She is a former member of the Washington, she is a former director, I'm sorry, a former director of the Washington Conservation Guild, and she's been active in WCG since 1987. I also want to thank uh, Julia's colleagues and co-presenters from the Tool Sling Genocide Museum, and they are Ko Chanda, Chang Sokpen, Chan Chetrai, Pang Shreinok, and Chu Sokli. Um, thank you for all of your efforts and all of your work on this. And uh, now, please, Julia, if you want to go ahead and take the screen. WCGers everywhere. I would first like to acknowledge that I live on lands that were taken from others. And I honor the ancestral homelands and waters, the people and the culture today of the Anacostans, the Piscataway and the Pamunkey populations. So, okay, technology working. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm afraid I don't think too many of my Cambodian colleagues are with us live because of the time change. Um, however, um, since this is being recorded, we have an opportunity for them um, to see it later and be part of this. They have tape recorded in advance five videos, which will be um, sort of tracked through this, this um, presentation. So they are here in spirit and here in voice. So anyway, since uh, about 2017, I've been actively working in Cambodia uh, at Tool Slang Genocide Museum. And this is a site that was called S21, Security Prison 21, that was established by the Khmer Rouge in 1975 when they took over completely Cambodia and put it under their own rule from 1975 to 1979. You can see a picture of it here on the left. It was a, it was a, a middle school, a fairly large compound, and it was converted into a mass detention and torture and extermination site. Over 18,000 people died here. And on the right, you can see in 1979 or 80, when the museum was first established, the clothing was piled onto um, large platforms in a way to really bear witness to the atrocities that had happened. The world didn't know about this and the world didn't believe it. And so the clothing was one of the really powerful materials that were used to convey to the world and to journalists and to the Cambodian public that you know, horrible atrocities had happened, had occurred. So here are three more images and you can see that the clothing is really highly piled up. Um, this tool slang today is a living memorial. Um, it is a very important site in Cambodia. There are not that many sites left that haven't been grown over by the jungle or um, been purposed for other things. And so this site is extremely important and it's a living memorial. And it really does present, you know, this um, an emotional and a cultural and conservation challenges to work on this material. In addition, um, I would say that most tourists that come to Cambodia, they go to Angkor Wat and they seem to make it to Tool Slang. So in 2019 alone, which was before the pandemic, there were over 120,000 foreigners that visited Tool Slang and about 400,000 Cambodian. Um, so 
Um, it's quite a project to manage this site. So in fact, during the period of when S21 was operating, all sorts of people were brought here, cadre and, and um, people from the military, from the Khmer Rouge forces, but also just women and men and children. And this is an image of the five little children that hid inside piles of clothing. And more recently, in the last couple of years, Noan Chanpal, who's the little boy in the middle standing, actually wrote a book about his story. And he uh, is one of three uh, survivors from Tool Slang Prison. There were only about four or five survivors that we know of. And he, he stays at Tool Slang every day and he talks to tourists and researchers about his experience. So the connection to the clothing is really quite palpable and powerful when we realize that five children survived hiding in the piles. Um, clothing is also, you know, it's part of this living memorial. Everything about it um, is part of this memorial. Photographs, torture devices, um, a huge collection in the archives of photographs and papers and forced confessions. And so all of this is part of the site plan today. And we really focused on the textile part, but we have in, enveloped and really um, tried to work on all aspects of preservation. The textile pro project really focused more on uh, essentially the triage to rescue textiles and training to expand the capacity, introduce conservation as a real practice to tool slang and build that capacity and build a team. So this is what I found in 2014 when I happened to be on holiday in Cambodia. I was working in nearby Thailand um, at the Queen Sarikat Museum and had been contacted by the then director, Vizat Chai, who asked me if I could please come over to Phnom Penh and take a look. He had just found 50 garbage bags and boxes full of textiles. And he said, you know, I need your help. I need your professional assistance. These are not garbage. They cannot be treated like garbage. We need to save them. I spent a very hot, sweaty day there and went away very moved and started looking for money. And it took about two years. Uh, we finally did receive a grant from the U.S. Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. And we were fortunate enough to actually get a repeat grant. So we had one that was awarded in 2017, 2018 and 2019. And then we had another one um, 2019 to 2021. We've had it extended through the end of this year. And this was primarily to work on the textiles, rescue them, um, you know, build a true collection and preserve them and as well implement training for the staff there. So it's a pretty dramatic change if you can see it there from pre-24 garbage bags, open fish crates, and then um, passive storage boxes. This is what I saw in 2014, just masses of mixed material, um, molded, mildewed, full of insects, bugs, birds, and this is the storage room today, which is in fact the same storage room, but we have nice shelving and we have a microclimate storage system. And so there's been huge progress in this during this um, three year project now. So how do we go forward with conservation of such sensitive and um, tactile material? All of it is important and all of it is extremely um, part of, it's part of everyone's history that works there. And so one of the most important things that I realized from the very beginning, and it was said to me by a dear friend in Phnom Penh was, no matter what you do, treat every single item with the deepest respect. And so that was the fundamental underpinning of this project. Um, you know, we incorporated regional sensitivities, um, became the guiding principle, um, along with modifying archeological approaches for textile conservation, local values in order to reduce risk. Um, the primary and the first objective was basically to try and rescue all of the material and not 
dive deeply into you know half of it or one third of it. So all of this was done in collaboration. And that's a really important part of this project was that all of the protocols, all of the decisions about how to treat the textiles were done not only with the team and some outside guests who would come from other museums to work with us, but with historians, with survivors, with the directors of this museum and others to discuss what was viable, what was acceptable within their cultural parameters. And for example, it was decided early on there would be nothing would leave the site. And secondly, there would be no wet cleaning that could run the risk of removing far too much material. Everyone agreed that taking an approach that less is more and leaving as much material, even debris and dirt intact, the context was very important to each of these textile objects. So here's the team and including bottom photo, you can see Jackie Peterson Grace, who's now at Colonial Williamsburg, who joined this project um, for both phase one and phase two. One of the really um, challenging things, first of all, is bilingual working. Um, I have almost no Khmer. I can speak Thai, but I'm afraid it's really not the same as Khmer. And um, really people's, everyone's English isn't all that great. So it's a lot of, uh, sometimes we have an interpreter, sometimes not. And so um, the kind of work to learn how to examine textiles, to find nomenclature, and come up with good, reliable vocabulary was very important. Nobody had had any background in textiles per se. Everyone is a graduate of the fine arts um, university with a background more in archeology span and art history. So just diving into textiles and learning how to describe them, how to see them, look for clues, information, um, weave structure, repairs, took a lot of time and repetition. So we developed these simple protocols. We learned by looking through initially some of the clothing that there were enough pieces one, that could be processed one by one, that they could become recognizable, that they were either whole or partially whole. So we developed an a, a, a protocol for working and trying to preserve those. We developed a different protocol for all of the fragments, which were all tangled in tiny pieces. And we put forward more of an archeological approach. And we had the storage of all this material. It's one thing to inventory it and surface clean it, but it's another to just try and implement a long-term storage system in a tropical climate without steady electricity. And then broadening through the actual um, training was environmental monitoring of the site and overall preventive training using as many, as many resources as we could and this great whiteboard, which was always very useful. So here is um, a video by Chenda. Uh, and second, we are doing with the textile on display at the museum. Now I can show you something about the textile in the museum. Here is the textile in the museum. We are not a closely because uh, it is easy when we are want to know how many material, how many textile in the museum. We are constructing. And then we are done even with one by one. We are need to make the event three for this one is a form for event three and then the app can clean silver cleaning with a vacuum and then the app with the fragment. For fragment the app has a mini stack and we are to separate with fragment and small fragment because uh fragment the app have no even three one 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 the app after we are separate the app can Checking, but for this one, we are use the archaeology archaeology technique. And then we are going to put all the big side in the dry box here. 
Thank you, Tenda. So one of the first things we did was actually to um, uh, sort through some of the clothing and sort them by types of textile. Obviously plastics, um, leathers, um, belts respond differently and are can be surface cleaned in one way, whereas um, tangled um, cotton clothing is handled differently. So that was a first step. A lot of this was done outside obviously with masks on, this is all pre-COVID, um, but we were suited up with masks on because of the nature of all the dust and dirt and other pathogens. Sorting textiles is a very important part of this work and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of courage actually. Um, this is a picture of Chenda and myself and we are going through a pile of clothes that was taken out of um, one of the cases. We, we had no idea what was in this pile. And it turned out to have some really remarkable and really touching children's clothes in it that nobody had really ever seen before. Or if somebody had, it was somebody previously at the museum, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, and we simply don't have the institutional knowledge to understand who handled them before. So sorting, putting them in like piles and talking about them. What do they mean to everybody? What do they mean to everyone on the team? Do they know, are these textiles familiar to them? Do they have clothing like this for their children? Did their grandmother have this children? The, 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 these textiles actually elicit a lot of stories, stories that come out of them about the human beings that wore them, as well as connected to stories of everyone that works on them today and they're part of a continuum of Cambodian history. One of the things you saw in Chenda's video was a whole wall of literally um, visual glossaries and visual workflows. Um, Jackie and I realized very early on that the more we could put into um, visual and, and um, writing together and bilingual, the better um, it, it would facilitate communication and cut down on errors. So you can see just the basic directions for how to do documentation and photography and developed a really good visual glossary. And as more and more different kinds of types of textiles became apparent, we've added to the glossary. The, the textiles that are whole or partially whole or recognizable are processed one by one. Um, and so these are surface clean, vacuumed, and then they're stored together as a type. They're given an accession number, um, documentation, photography is taken before and after treatment, and that basically means after surface cleaning. Um, here's an example of you know, a woman's camisole and, and the materials we use, um, the tools we use for photography, and silk pen is standing high on a stool there. Um, the textile lab itself is at Tool Slang. It's on the third floor of a building. It is a former room where prisoners were detained. So there are still um, shackles and poles attached to the wall. And it's a daily and constant reminder that we work in a space where these textiles presided and where the people who once wore them um, died. So it's with deep respect that we continue to do this work the inventory and database was really a foundation for everything we did. It's very important to try and get this documentation since it had never been done before. So we developed a bilingual um, inventory form with description condition and um, everyone at Toolslang does this by hand and with lots of discussion and sharing. And here's a copy of it and we tried to make it as easy as possible with a lot of checkoff boxes um, in order to try and um, help with recognition and sharing uh, technical information that was reliable. 
and accurate. Then an abbreviated amount of data is put into an Excel database with a drop down menu. And this is really important. It doesn't have images in it yet, but um, it, you can't make errors when you have a drop down menu. Um, this also can, is searchable. So if we wanted to find everything that was a child, we could search that way or everything that was blue um, or everything that belonged to a religious um, or lay person. So it has some really useful searchable fields. And I think eventually uh, tool slang will end up getting um, a database, a larger uh, database for their entire collection. And hopefully this, everything will be migrated together. But we had to come up with this quickly um, and it works. We have 12 searchable fields and moving on to treatment. Now treatment was something that was really decided in collaboration. Treatment is minimal, you know, less is more. We, everyone decided that first of all, no wet cleaning, but second of all, um, collaboratively and unanimously, everyone agreed that some surface cleaning is really important because it might reveal more information from that particular textile or piece of clothing. We might be able to see more details, color, name, um, repairs, and that would provide um, more history um, about this particular piece and about S21. So we proceeded with careful surface cleaning using vacuum. And here, Nock will speak about this. Hello everyone, my name is Lina. Today I would like to show you about the Fair Clean On collection in Goose Lang Kinestan Museum. So for the collection, we cannot use uh, water to clean it. We need to use dry cleaning because everything on collection is the history. So we can use a soft brush to clean it up to remove the dirt from the clothes. And for a lot of dust, we can use a vacuum and we can use a screen to cover and protect the collection. And we can clean by a very slow Nock's comment that her work is so important because by preserving the memory and preserving these materials, you can help prevent this from happening again. And I think that fundamentally drives the work that we do on a daily basis. And it's taken some time to really get to this point, but together we share, we really share that, that um, uh, fundamental approach in our work. I will say also that you know vacuuming is a new technique for everyone. Vacuums are not common in Cambodia. In fact, they're not really common in many countries. Um, in Cambodia, most most rooms and areas are swept or brushed or mopped, and so off to the market to a variety of stores to buy several different kinds of vacuums and then learn how to use them. So even just something like a vacuum cleaner um, is uh, is kind of a novel uh, method, novel tool to get to use, but everyone really likes it. Um, surface cleaning, some more examples of working very 
uh, carefully with surface cleaning. And then again, the working with the fragments, these were approached differently, a mass approach, not one by one and really based on archeological models. You can see an archeological tray there that I brought from the United States. And then we made more prototypes uh, in Cambodia. And this was very difficult work. Um, it was hot, is really, really dusty. We would sift them two or three or four times. And you can see on the right-hand side, many of the really small items that, that fall out, um, including a gold earring, tiny bags that valuables and money and jewelry were kept in while people um, were in these work camps. Uh, and so the dirt and all of the debris that came out of these are saved as well. It's all considered um, part of the object and it's believed that they all have spirit and human agency in them. So here are some of the other fragments some, you know, many small wallets, toothbrushes, um, parts of an old skirt. But on the left hand side, you see a really tattered fragment uh, of a traditional silk uh, weaving from Cambodia. And this is one of very few sort of traditional high end textiles that were found among these, these remains. So here's just a summary of all the textile groups. You can see there's quite a variety, but by far the most pieces um, are caps. Um, so quite a lot of military, more than half of the, the textile items are basically military or military associated like bags and canteens and um, belts. So storage, you know, this was a challenge. Something had to be done. Uh, you can't just inventory a collection like this and stick it back in open crates or air condition a room and hope that that's going to work. And in about 2012, I had discovered um, this, this method of microclimate storage and keeping um, materials dry through the agriculture industry. It's used with farmers to keep seed dry. And so I thought, all right, we will try to adapt this for cultural heritage. So we did quite a few trials here in the United States and in Thailand. And um, Tool Slang was one of the first places we implemented this. It's based on a molecular sieve technology. So we have zeolites, which absorb water molecule only. Um, and so they're placed into a clear plastic box that has um, hygrometer, uh, hygrometers on it so that the RH and the temperature can be read easily uh, and manually. Nothing has to be transmitted through um, a computer. And so we've set up the storage system like this. Um, what's important about this is to try, the goal was to set up a sustainable, easy to use, low cost, electricity free system that could work and try to keep actually the RH pretty low um, in this very, very tropical high relative humidity climate. So it's a pretty simple system. Um, these are 72 liter boxes and we put one or two or three um, kilos of dry bead into each box and in these mesh bags, close the box. And when we see that the RH has gone down to 30 or 35, open the box, take the beads out. It jumps up five or so degrees and close it. And what we have determined is that the RH stays relatively stable for many months. In fact, even when the ambient temperature and relative humidity in the storeroom fluctuate wildly and in the monsoon go to 100% all the time, the RH in these boxes remains very stable. So um, we're in the going into the third year of running this system and um, it's working very well. Uh, Silk Pen is the person that checks this every day. Errors seem to come up to either a broken seal on a box or a cracked box, or the beads haven't been regenerated properly. So here Silk Pen will tell, she's taking you into the storage. Oops, she went back. Where is she? I don't see how to get hers going. Oh dear. I don't know. We seem to not have her video going. I'm sorry, you all, I'll just move on then. Um, okay, so I'm 
Hello everyone, my name is Sophie and I respond on the computer and community the textile conservation at the Tuscan Genetic Museum. I come to store it now because I want to check uh, the temperature and humidity in the monitoring on the dry box. Because we want to know about the humidity and temperature inside the dry box. When the, uh, when the humidity high, we must have the dry bit inside and then we check out when the humidity low. But we have the humidity here, humidity here. It's the twenty percent. Of, we have the humidity is so low, so we must open the box, and then, uh, when the had the humidity seventy to hundred, we must add the dry bit inside because it so high and will be have the insect and the other textile will the will have the problem and the humidity the go had the the bad for the our textile with the humidity thirty percent until sixty percent and for this job, I'm so happy because I can prepare and take care of something uh, at the Tuslai Genestan uh, Museum and can talk to the world about the story of what happened in the our museum. Thank you. In summary, there are about 1,400 pieces of clothing, either whole or partial or recognizable. Out of those are about 280 what we call special ID. And special ID is um, quantified by something that's one of a kind, or maybe it has a repair, um, a name, a label. It's unique in some way, and it, or it speaks to someone on the team that is special. And then there are about 2,000 fragments and pieces of plastic. Um, these materials now, now cleaned and cataloged and sort of protected are really historic touchstones. And we've gone from mass groups, like you see on the left, to teasing and identifying out of it individual pieces which reveal human stories and more about the history of S21. Um, I think this is really important because these textiles actually attempt to, through this conservation work, these textiles really attempt to restore humanity and the individuality of the victims. And now Chitrai will tell you a little bit about this process. My name is Chitrai. I'm basically here at the Textile Conservation Lab of the Land Museum. Museum. Okay, now I want to show you about the about the object and and inventory form. Okay, I show you this here inventory number and then the object, object depth, object history, material dimension and object description. Okay, I show you about the, the objects here. They made to search. Okay, now the book is to be lost, but uh, they seek uh, to book it new. Yes. Here and then uh, it has some for the fabric and then the uh, uh, stitch by hand. You can see this one by hand. 
and then so and, and so uh, future of the third, you can see a tear, tear, and then that inside you can hear a, a stitch or so. And then you can see the the button a big and small a difference a colossal. Now we now we now we can see the the whole you can see that this one a, a teaching by hand and then uh, inside you can see the the castle support of a uh, sarong this one and this a sarong a color also yellow white Give also, and then uh, this one, the the same like this one, uh, a kind of support by fabrics. They made to insert, and then you can see this one, the 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 karma, the karma, uh, uh, is tied and connect with the button. Okay, like this one. So I'm going to move a little bit more quickly as we're low on time, but um, this is might have been the shirt that he was looking at, which has over 20 really beautiful loving patches on it. And this is the kind of thing, as you could see, Chetrai and members of the conservation department are really examining um, and learning from and drawing history from. And I think in their own words, we did an exercise this year where um, each person selected an item and wrote about it, both description and what it meant to them. And for example, the second one is a child's dress. And as Srinok says, it tells of the lives of the victims before they came to S21. And that this was probably a well-to-do family because the dress is fancy and it, it came from Japan. It has a label. The cap at the bottom actually has a writing, a written name of the man whose cap it belonged to, and it confirms that this victim had previously joined S21 and was a soldier and not one of the guards at the prison. So pretty remarkable information comes out of these textiles and they are beginning to actually cross-reference with the archives and examine them more closely now that each piece has been inventoried. And people in the archives are taking interest in what is in the textile collection. So we've gone from large mass groups to very personal pieces and personal stories. There are 280 items that are unique. And as I mentioned, there are 480 caps of which we have the most of, of any type of textile. And there are 18 caps actually that all have human personal names on them. So these have all been carefully cataloged and conservation team is trying to research some of these in the um, paper archives. But you know what this training has done is really elevated the significance of clothing at tool slang and by extension in Cambodia. And it has helped really nurture a new group of young um, heritage professionals who really care about their history. Part of that, you can see Chenda on the left interviewing um, one of the survivors who had been the little boy uh, hiding in the clothes. And everyone has really learned and has agree agrees that this work is about preservation and it's about healing. Some of the projects that have gone on over the last year, um, I, I must say that the pandemic has actually had a plus side for all of us because instead of me going to Cambodia once or twice a year for a month, I've met with the team every week. Um, and so I think that's one we've kept in touch really closely and it's built a friendship and deepened our relationship. One of the things that we did over this year was to actually try to modify this small case. Um, there were too many textiles in it. So we went through a, divide, a design process, discussing different options and approach with the director. 
and then they made a mock-up and then they worked with ethafoam for the first time, a glue, a hot glue gun for the first time with me on the Zoom calls. And they created this lovely mountain shape, which would go back into the case and create a look that looked like a lot of clothes, but actually we went from 275 pieces in the case to about 20. And here is Sok Lee, who will say a little bit about this. Sokli. Some of the other things the team's been very busy with and we've done through Zoom meetings is setting, helping to work on an exhibition that opened last year commemorating the 40th anniversary of this museum and living memorial. And this included designing a case and picking selecting items including textiles for it and learning how to mount them. Um, and I was lucky enough to be there for a conference so I was able to actually help in person as well as on Zoom. And I brought a hygrometer, a small one that can reside in the case. And we were able to reduce the lighting in the, in the gallery by putting screens in. So these kinds of approach um, really help physically to show everyone how things can be done quite simply, but rigorously. Over the last 10 months, um, Srinok and Sok Lee have done uh, a risk assessment of the entire contents, object contents of the museum and um, presented that to the directors and to the ministry. And that's really a great blueprint moving forward. And one of the most important things is, you know, the balance always of access to the collections, the authenticity, and how to preserve these objects at a living memorial. We talk about everything on Zoom now, um, including our WCG talk and how to deal with COVID. Everybody is in total lockdown right now. They all went into the museum, especially to make the videos and everyone is from at working from home. We also talk about, you know, what does it mean to be a conservator and what's most important and how can they share their knowledge with others? You know, over the last year, I think these constant meetings every week has really forged a deeper understanding between us and everyone's roles as stewards of cultural heritage and their own culture. Um, and it's given people a confidence to really speak out, um, to take actions. And I really just facilitate and advise, they really have the say. One of the really important things they do and they do, everyone does really well is to share the knowledge and explain conservation work from tool slang to visitors, to funders, to UNESCO, COICA, all kinds of groups come to visit. Um, there is just, there's such a rich visual experience looking at a variety of textiles. Um, so the director really brings every group into the lab to see the progress. Um, and, it, and everyone is very proud of this work. Um, these are the officers, uh, cultural affair officers from the US Embassy come on a regular basis. They're really, really super pleased with this project. A lot of bang for their buck. We were one of two or three projects globally to get um, a second grant to continue our work. So um, it's really rewarding to work so closely with their team as well. And participated in STEM fairs, connecting conservation and science. Um, and I just think that, you know, everyone is really uh, embraced um, conservation and defining their own role in it as a new group of heritage professionals. So 
continuing plans, really hope for future trainings and exchanges. This grant ends the end of this year, 2021. Um, they are working now on a portable exhibition about phase one, phase two of this textile preservation project, which will open the end of this year or early next year. Um, there's a huge object storage of over 3000 items, which badly, badly needs help in reorganizing and upgrading. So we are very open to volunteers or trying to continue working with other people who could mentor and help shape um, future paths and eventually some new exhibits, but that's tied in with the ministry. So I wanna thank everyone, the entire team at Tool Slang, Mr. Hengni Say, I don't know if he's on this on this Zoom um, or not, but thank you and former director Chevy Zoth for bringing me in to do this um, and really being so enthusiastic and supportive and all of my colleagues and coworkers. And so if you all want to contact um, one of us, you can, emails are here for myself, for Chenda, and for Pekcha, who is the head of the archives, and he is willing to um, answer particular questions about archives, and also just the link for the museum. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Julia. That was that was very, very inspiring. That's amazing work that's being done. Um, we will have a question and answer session, if that's OK. Do you still have time for that? We have a few yeah, minutes anyway. Um, we, of course, have some congratulations pouring in to Julia and the team talking about a fascinating talk. But a couple of the questions we have, if uh, let's see if I can go directly to these. One of them is uh, someone asking, how can we help support your work? Well, I think, uh, thank you for asking. Um, I think that the next phase is um, to have new people mentor and um, uh, lead this conservation team forward. And one of the biggest priorities is actually the objects. And there are about 3000 objects, all mixed material, metal, concrete, typewriters, cameras, everything that was used at this detention prison. So they're currently just in an open storeroom covered in dirt and dust. So an inventory needs to be built, you know, having having one or two or three people, even graduates of programs to be able to physically help with this, help design um, object forms, help outline a template of how to move forward with this. I think this could happen um, in 2022, actually. Um, everyone in 2021, we're, we're, we're dragging a bit. It's hard with COVID. Everyone is at home, then they're able to go back to work and then have to go home again. I have no idea how this year is going to shake out or whether I'll physically ever go back or not. But they will produce an exhibit, which will be a traveling exhibition, which is very important. And then after that, they can pivot their, their priorities to the object um, collection. So I would say assistance with that, which also means trying to find money to do this or having your own resources or finding grants. But we generally have to do that. Um, they're not as easy to find in Cambodia. We, we did have a question about the funding. Someone wanted to know what the future is in, in terms of your funding and, and what you envision or what's envisioned, uh, not necessarily you, but in general, what's the vision going forward for funding? Uh, this is the, this is the end of the line for the funding from the U.S. Ambassadors Grant for Cultural Preservation. We've gotten two, and that's really unusual. And so we will not apply again. And we even if we did, we would not receive it. I know that. And moreover, we have finished inventorying all the textiles. We built the database. We have set up a very successful storage room and moved on to general preventive conservation and monitoring. So. I think that future projects are going to have to look elsewhere for um, funding, whether it's through, um, you know, other organizations. I, I, I know that JICO, which is Japanese aid, COICO, which is Korean aid, UNESCO are all operating in Cambodia. They fund other projects. They fund library work, national museum work. There's a, a lot of competition for this, but funding can also come through individuals who can 
find five or ten thousand dollars to go and work for a couple of months and figure out next steps and enhance and do on-site training. Um, so I don't actually have a blueprint for anyone and I haven't thought too far ahead, but by the end of 2021, um, you know, my 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 regular exchange will 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 have ended. I mean, I'll always be in touch. They've become yeah. friends, but that's different. Uh, another question, someone, actually a couple of people have posed, they're curious about, is there any interest in DNA analysis for any reason? Would this figure into future visions of uh, the collections? It comes up all the time. Many, many non-Cambodians contact tools slang to ask about DNA analysis. Mm -hmm. I don't know what drives that, but many, many foreigners write and say, do you want DNA analysis done, this, that, and the other? And, and, and actually, no one to date has ever put forth any kind of research questions about what this would be about or why. Mm -hmm. There are no DNA libraries in Cambodia. So mm -hmm. what are you going to compare it to? And maybe down the road, um, material could be extracted out of dirt, soil, um, clothing that might provide relevant information you know, about soil, about dates. Um, I'm not sure, but in fact, that would really require someone with a thoughtful research project um, built in collaboration with the Ministry of Culture and Tool Slang, because this kind of information and this extraction of information has to be very carefully done and transparently and with the approval. You know, just it's sensitive material. Um, just recently, there was um, there was uh, some artist or photographer who um, um, modified and restored some photographs of victims of the of the Khmer mm -hmm. genocide, and and then posted them publicly. And he had colored them and he had changed the expressions. And when the ministry and moreover said that he was collaborating and working with tool slang on this project. And they had never heard of him and they had no idea, but these images, some of them had been taken from their archives. So the Ministry of Culture shut this all down, put disclaimers out, Vice took it off their site. I think this is, you know, is a warning for what can happen and what probably will happen. The archives has just been fully digitized and they have launched a website and it took them months to create a platform where they could really um, monitor and have levels of gatekeepers so that you know, dark tourism and other predatory um, you know instances will be diminished. It is very important for survivor families and for other qualified researchers to have access to these archives both paper photo and textile. So down the road I think you know, that's why we don't get rid of any of the dirt or particles and you know it's all there so that when these projects uh, are more fully realized when there's a conservation team that has arrived at a point where they can envision a project like this um, the ministry's in in agreement then something can be built in collaboration i think that dovetails very nicely with a question someone wrote in i'll, I'll read it it says first thank you for the very moving talk i would like to ask how do you decide which textiles would be conserved and which ones, or which uh, which one would not, or do you conserve them all? We conserve them all, and by conserve I mean documentation, which is probably the most important part of the whole conservation protocol. Um, some of these may not last forever, but we will have the documentation, and um, the preservation right now consists of surface cleaning. Um, so that a lot of the dirt and encrustations and things that might really rot into the textile more quickly, like all that termite, termite encrustation, are carefully removed, all that material is kept, and then they are preserved also by the use of a microclimate storage. That is part of the preservation plan. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, that's a passive approach. In fact, the whole approach is pretty passive. It's mm -hmm. low in intervention because I believe in the future, you know, more in-depth work can occur um, tied to specific projects or when the team has the time 
or the reasons to go more deeply into analysis or treatment of particular pieces to tell a particular story or um, work on a research project. Those haven't been identified yet. Um, this is triage. This is really triage. Really, really thoughtful, tender triage. And a I lot have, of training. I have one more question for you, Julia. It says, Julia, thank you for this talk. Can you share a little more about what you and the team did? Uh, whoops. Uh, throughout your, your work days to ensure that you treated these objects with the respect warranted even when processing so very many items? Um, yes. Um, you know, a work day started actually with at least one member of the team bringing um, food offerings for the shrine, the Buddhist shrine that's in the conservation lab, and asking for the blessings and permission to work with this material that is extremely important and has human spirit in it. So every day started like that. And then um, just simply we work through the day in often in pairs or, or threesome and really try to work closely together and help each other figure out accurate answers or examine more deeply. Um, and try to respect, we really respect one another and we think about the survivors um, who we can consult and talk with them. And so our conservation is much bigger than the material. It's about the stories uh, that, are, that are part of these textiles. It's about um, everyone's connection to their own history as well as future history. And as you could see from my colleagues, some of their comments, they are very dedicated to try and share this information with the younger generations because they are not being informed about this period of history in a very thorough way. And Tool Slang really wants to make that an important part of their, um, their offering to the Cambodian public. So um, this is something that the team is really aware of and wants wants to make this more available, not just about the textiles, but why is conservation important? What does it mean to us? Um, yeah, it's a pretty cool job. They're doing an amazing, amazing work that nobody had ever done before. There's a lot of pride when, in it. Oh, I can see it. And when you said there had been 400,000 Cambodians who have come? Um, in 2019, that's, that was the record of visitorship. Yeah. Well, one a viewer has asked, it was said it was a very emotional and sensitive talk. Has there been opportunity for families of those who lived in these camps to see the textiles in storage or in the database? And I asked this in terms for their own closure and stories. We hope that is what will happen. Um, because we are just in the final throes of finishing this inventory, and it really hasn't been that well publicized either domestically or, or anywhere else. Um, I think that news will get out. The paper and photograph archive at Tool Slang was finally digitized and launched with a very big ceremony, hugely funded by COICA and UNESCO. And so the light's been shining on that, but that leads to the textile archive now. And so many people that come in to use the actual physical paper photographic archive are now being led to the textile archive. They can do simple research and searching in our Excel database and see whether they see anything that might be recognizable um, or a name that might resonate. So we hope that this will become part of survivor families um, you know, the capability for them to use this. But so far, just only very few people have, have been able to do it. Mm -hmm. one, um, one other question was about, with the individual care and attention that you've given to each item, has, there, has the team learned anything new about the traditional Cambodian weaving or sewing that otherwise would, has been lost in the genocide? Um, there are very, very few pieces of really traditional, beautiful Cambodian textile. We saw one silk fragment. There's a piece of a dance costume, a couple sarongs. I don't even know if they're domestic 
So, you know, the fine textiles did not survive if they even made it um, through that period. Um, it, it's just a few scraps that ended up in this particular um, stash of clothing. So they've learned more, I would say, about in general ready to wear clothing, what was worn by rural and people during this time period. They've learned that clothing was extremely simple, that people had very little of it, that it had to be repaired over and over again. Some of the patches we see, and Chetri mentioned that, he pointed to a sarong, which is a traditional cloth. He pointed to um, the cloth that was made to hook a button, and that was made from a tr traditional um, a Cambodian scarf called a krama. So, you know, they are learning about traditional textiles. They are learning about textiles in general and what's handwoven, what's machine woven, what's hand stitched, what's machine stitched, what might be imported by virtue of a, a tag or synthetic material. There's quite a lot of nylon. I think it's all military issue. So they're learning about a lot of just textile technology of probably the 60s, 70s, um, which is this time period. Thank you so much, Julia. To you and all of your team, all of your colleagues at Tool Slang, uh, it was a wonderful talk. And I, I feel like it's such significant work, but it's also a great model for this kind of remote work that you've been doing as well as the on-site. Thank you so much for that. Um, we really appreciate it. And before I leave everyone else tonight, I just want to remind all the members to go and vote before midnight, you need to do your ballots. And for everyone else, please go to the uh, website and uh, either join if you want to or participate in the raffle, all of that's available to you. But thank you again. And for those of you who look forward to these meetings, we'll see you in the fall. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Julia, I don't know if you saw my message, but to try, I just logged in. <laughs> I sent a message to him, so. Um, oh dear, oh gosh, oh well. I'm just looking over the chat for one yeah, second. Yeah, you had some wonderful comments. <laughs> so I'm so sorry, I guess he got the time wrong. That's all right. I wonder how that could happen. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you why it happens. It's daylight savings is what does it. Well, and it's 4.30 normally... a.m. there. Yeah. yeah. We're normally a 12 hour difference, but then when we go into oh. daylight saving, we're a 13 hour difference. It's very confusing. Um, yeah. And they're a day ahead. So, um, gosh, Deborah Troop and my, my gosh, is there any way to get a transcript of the chat? No. Yes, no. you can do that. No. Oh, yeah, you can download it. I can download it for you, I think. Um, I, I've turned that off, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you for <laughs> um, There's a lot of really wonderful old friends here as well. Um, Magali Bertin is a French-Canadian researcher who's doing her PhD in Cambodian silk, and she's part <laughs> we've partnered on writing a chapter about these textiles for a publication that Tool Slang is doing about all their collections. Um, so she was on here. And I was everybody. here. I want to say hello to Chetrai, but I don't, he's not, I can't see his camera on. It's just, I can't see it either. He's there, but too much. He, he may not even have a camera because I there's such limited um, Wi Fi. All right. Well, if you get him, say hello because I, I would like to say hi. Too. Okay. Hi, hi. <laughs> so well thank you everyone a lot thank you to caitlin who's always here you know? thank you, caitlin. <laughs> Caitlin's worked with me in rwanda and i keep thinking she's worked with me in cambodia but then not yet so but getting younger people to get there and work and share their knowledge with enthusiasm and flexibility and um you gotta you gotta be strong too you know um so I think it's important for younger people to get involved in projects like this. It is for me because I'm getting older and it's harder to do. So, <laughs> so thank you all. Ariana, thank you so much for doing the videos. And Your I'm captions were perfect. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed, of course, a couple, a couple typos as I was.
oh, listening to them and watching them again. Think, like to the 31th, the 31st time. It's not the 30th no, time. It was, uh, I'm sure it took a lot of time and it was very much appreciated. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Mm -hmm. I'm glad and, that there were videos. Uh, really sorry about Silk Pen's video. I, we couldn't <laughs> find the, the button to, yeah. to run it. So That's I'm okay. Sure yeah, I was happened. thinking about that. Maybe you could run it and we can still at another time and then we can record it and put it in at the end of the recording for when it gets posted to YouTube. Technically, right. Ariana has the file, I think. I do. Yeah. 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 So we yeah. could be. No, stuck I, it in. I can yeah. send it to Miguel if you if you would like to splice it on or we can work it out, Miguel. I think that would be good to add it on to the end before it goes on to on to YouTube. Great. And thank you all for the opportunity to do this. You know, I can't ever say no to WCG, but quite honestly, um, I want people to know about this project, but it's uh, it's taken a little while to actually feel like it's something I can easily share. It's difficult to talk about. And I've also always wanted my colleagues to be part of that presentation. And that's that's a challenge, both with language and distance and time changes. So. Thank you for the suggestion to have them do videos and, and supplement it that way. That was a great idea. And, um, you know, it's really important that a little light is shined on their work mm -hmm. and that support comes in from other people and other avenues to try and keep some momentum going at Tool Slang because people are really, really anxious and really dedicated to try and save these this aspect of their history. Mm -hmm. They really get it. So... The methods are different than what we use here and in museums, but you know what? They're mm -hmm. working. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, thank you all. Ariana. Yes, thank you very much. It was wonderful. It was and wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for sending me the chat too, Ariana. I appreciate it. I, I think so. I'm not, I, I will do my best to do that. Okay. Okay. All right. I copied it and was going to. Okay. Yeah, I believe. Um, Deborah Troopin said the oh. chat. Oh, I tried to copy it. I was like, oh, that's great. great. Oh, and Mary Ballard was there. Goodness. Okay, it would be nice great. to see who was there. Thank, Thank you. you all. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Caitlin. Bye. <laughs> nice to meet you.